This lecture is going to take you through surveillance as a form of crime control and prevention. It's going to look at the different types of surveillance in modern society, the different views on the use of surveillance in society, and then evaluate it, the role that surveillance plays in terms of crime control and prevention. As before, um, use the video to take notes, pause and rewind as necessary. And use your notes grid um, in your ISB to kind of help you know what you need to take notes on and then highlight the grid to indicate your levels of confidence with each question box. Now to start with, I've got a little bit of a, a quiz for So let's start by looking at the numbers relating to surveillance in the UK today. So we've got 2016. 1 in 11, 71 percent, 70, 40 million and 8,787,892. So I just want you to take a minute, pause the video or wait and see if you can think of how this might relate to surveillance in the UK, how these numbers might relate to surveillance in the UK. OK, so let's start with 2016. 2016 was the introduction of the Investigatory Powers Act. Now, this was a very controversial act when it was introduced because it allowed police forces and security services and intelligence services in the government to demand your Internet history from your Internet provider without a warrant. So they didn't need to go to court and get a court order to, to get that information. They could just ask and the um, internet provider could hand over that information. So every website you've um, visited, every password, every piece of information they have on you, everything you've watched on YouTube would then be available to the police and security services. Now, the idea behind the act was that it would allow them to allow the police forces, this intelligence services, to preempt terrorist attacks or um, find um, child paedophile rings and things like that and um, act as a way of getting them the, the, the bad people a lot quicker. Um, but people were quite upset by this act because it also kind of breached privacy and um, without a court order, they could just say you were suspected of something. Whereas with a court order, with a warrant, you have to provide the judge with enough evidence to say that to suggest that they, they would need this um, data. Now, one in 11 refers to the ratios of cameras to people in the UK. So there is one CCTV camera for every 11 people in the UK estimated. OK, now it may be more and maybe less, but um, this is kind of estimated because not everyone has an active working CCTV camera. They might just have the, the, the hardware, but it doesn't actually do anything. Um, but one, for every 11 people in the UK, there is one CCTV camera. So that's a lot of CCTV cameras. 71% re refers to the number, the percentage of police forces in the UK that uses body cams. Now, this is increasing um, and as um, more information and more testing and um, studies are done, there are more and more police forces in the UK who are adopting body cams as a um, part of the uniform. But at the moment, it's about 71% of police forces in the UK that insist that their police officers wear body cams when on duty. 70 is the average number of times a day a Briton will be caught on a CCTV camera. Now this is in ordinary times, this is not COVID times when hardly anyone's leaving the house. We are actually talking about normal times when you're going about your day-to-day -day business, when you're going into town, going shopping, going to supermarket, things like that. On average, it's about 70 times a day, which is a lot. 
8,787,892 is the estimated number of CCTV cameras in the UK. Okay, so these might be government ones, they might be um, privately owned ones, but that's why it's an estimate because not everyone will admit that they've got CCTV. Um, but there's a lot of cameras. And finally, 40 million is the number of car number plates that are scanned by automatic number plate recognition per day. And that's not counting multiple scans of the same number plate. This is individual number plates that are scanned by automatic number plate um, recognition every day. And again, this is pre-COVID times when there were more people on the roads and more people traveling around places. But there's a lot of cars and it, it kind of all of these numbers really do suggest to us that there is a lot of surveillance that, that perhaps we are living in a big brother era where our entire lives are being watched i mean not quite truman show level um or big brother uh or Wells big brother in terms of the novel but it is quite persuasive pervasive as to how much surveillance we are under on a day-to-day -day basis and how much of our lives are monitored and how much of our lives are recorded without our knowledge or without our without us realizing so there are different types of surveillance so let's have a look at the different types of surveillance that we're talking about so the first one is physical surveillance so these are the cctv cameras the guards the police the military the actual physical watching of other people and they're, they're a lot more obvious that they're there to surveil they're, they're there to to watch us so physical surveillance is quite obvious when it's happening the next is not so much and that's what's referred to as liquid surveillance and this is kind of linking to your digital footprint and your digital and digital surveillance so things like when you use your phone or you pay for something with a credit card, it allows people to monitor and check where you are, what you're spending, what you're buying, how often you're buying, track where you've been. Um, even if you turn off the GPS on your phone, it's, it can still be tracked by um, cell towers and when you've got calls coming in and things like that, you kind of see it on tv shows and things like that when they track um, mobile phones but also the mobile phone company can now turn your gps on so if you go missing for example then the uh, police um, can go to the mobile phone company and say this person is vulnerable and we're worried they, they haven't been seen can we can you please turn on their gps so that we can see where they are now that obviously only works if your phone is turned on um but it is quite amazing about how much of our digital lives are monitored and at the moment even more so with our lives being very much digital due to lockdowns and things so it's things like what you buy in a supermarket will then be used to target advertising towards you in your emails or suggested items um the things that you search up on the internet link into those adverts that you get down the side of twitter and um facebook and places like that your um watching habits on netflix links in with your suggestions as to what you might want to watch next so all of these things, the cookies, uh, the internet cookies and your um, anything digital can be monitored and can be checked. And that was a really big thing that came out um, quite recently as to people selling on your digital data and using your data for targeted um, advertising and things like that. And people not being aware that that's what was happening. So when we're talking about liquid surveillance, we are talking about your digital footprint and the, the, the surveillance of your digital world, your digital um, existence. And the third type of surveillance is self-surveillance. And self-surveillance is um, self-checking. And it links to this idea that we 
are constantly checking our behavior and checking what we're doing, what we're wearing, because we're worried about how people will judge us. And with all the other types of surveillance that we have in society today, people have become a lot more judgy. Um, so people will consider when before doing something, maybe subconsciously and probably a, a lot more than we realize, but we'll consider how will this play to other people? How will this look to other people? Will I come across as the bad person? Will, um, and now things like memes and things like that, you've got, there's the, the worry that you'll become a meme. If you do something silly and it's caught on camera, whether it be somebody's mobile phone or whether it be a CCTV camera, these things can become viral memes and viral um, internet um, sensations. And it's therefore people are placing judgment upon your behavior. So people start self-checking, they, they, they self-surveil. How does this look to other people if I do this? Or what, what, what could happen should I do this? Now, it varies on individual choices to which one you think is more pervasive in society or which one you have has more influence over our behaviour. But when we're looking at surveillance, we need to bear in mind that there are these three different types. We're not just talking about CCTV. We're not just talking about the police watching us or being under surveillance by the police. We are also talking about our digital surveillance and digital footprints and how we self monitor and self surveil. So moving on, we need to look at what the main focus of this session is to look at how surveillance can be used as a form of crime prevention and the different views on surveillance within society today. So there are there are lots of different views and lots of different ideas. Um, the first one we're going to look at is the idea of surveillance society, which comes from Lyon, who you'll remember from um, postmodernism. And what Lyon suggests is that um, our everyday life has become less private, particularly in technologically advanced societies. We we're we're more open, we're more public with our lives. It's very hard to keep things private now. And this form of surveillance, is, and if you like digital surveillance, liquid surveillance, has become routine and it's become pervasive. It's something we expect and it's something that is ingrained within our lives now. Um, and it's about, um, and the focus of the surveillance society is on personal details in terms of influence, management and control. So it's using that data that's collected on us via our digital footprint, via our physical um, surveillance to influence us, to manage us and to control us. So, for example, as I said, with the um, Internet, when when you do a search and all of a sudden you get all the adverts for something coming up down the side of your Facebook page or your Twitter feed or your Instagram page. Um, that's seeking to influence us. It's like, oh, you are interested in teddy bear onesies. Let's send you loads of stuff about onesies. OK, um, and sometimes that can be quite interesting. And some of their ideas are, are very interesting. Um, of So, um, for example, uh, when my niece was first born, obviously I posted on social media about being an auntie again. And um, all of a sudden, down the side of my Twitter feed, I was getting um, fertility treatments and bulk buying nappies and things like that because I'd mentioned a baby. So th th there's a lot of uh, creative license with, with this sort of thing. But in terms of criminality, we can see how this um, surveillance society, this having less privacy can control behavior and stop people acting in deviant ways and stop people committing crimes because it's harder to keep things secret. Um, and you do get you do get stupid criminals who do kind of post about their criminal activities on social media. Um, 
And a, a very good example is the recent um, riots at the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. They used the footage from the CCTV cameras and from the mobile phone cameras to identify the rioters and arrest them. And that's showing how this surveillance society can act as a form of crime control and crime prevention, because these people were then publicly named and shamed as being part of the rioters in um, the Capitol building. The next one we're going to look at is the idea of disciplinary society. And this comes from Foucault, and I'm probably mispronouncing his name and I do apologise, but there we go. Um, and his idea that disciplinary power is now everywhere and everyone is subjected to it. And he gives the example of CCTV cameras in public spaces. We don't look at that as being odd. It's seen as routine, it's seen as normal. And people now follow the rules and follow and act in appropriate ways because they know they're being watched. They self-regulate their behaviour for fear of becoming or being seen as the wrong sort of person. So as a society, we've become disciplinary. We, we are self-disciplining ourselves. But Foucault takes it a step further and also talks about how society has become carceral, which is another way of saying a punishment society. And what he meant by that is that um, punishment has moved away from the criminal justice system. It's become, it's become removed from prisons and the criminal justice system and has started creeping into everyday government interaction and government function. And the example Foucault gives is in America, if you want to get food stamps to, because you are below the poverty line um, and you're struggling, you are subjected to random drug testing. And if you test positive for drugs, you are not given your food stamps. So that's not following through any criminal justice system. The government is punishing you and choosing to punish you based on their own arbitrary choices. OK, so for Foucault, not only is society because of using surveillance to become disciplinary, it's also using um, surveillance to, put, to, to create a punishment led society that's outside of the criminal justice system. Next up, we've got synoptic surveillance, and this is the idea from Matt Matheson. And Matheson argues that um, surveillance isn't just su governments watching us. It's not top down. It's now also bottom up because everybody is watching everyone else. And what he meant by that is that, yes, we've got the government watching us to control our behaviour, but we're now, as a population, as a citizenry, are also surveilling the people at the top. We're, we're surveilling the, the ruling class. Um, Thompson refers to this as media surveillance and the use of the media paparazzi and um, media, 24-hour uh, news and social media as a form of surveillance and a form of social control over the controllers. So it's about the citizenry, the normal everyday people, controlling the controllers and managing their behaviour. So this can kind of link in with that idea of selective law enforcement and um, how uh, different social class and crime trends is things could be changing because it's now a lot harder for the ruling class to hide their criminal activity and their deviant behaviour because the everyday person is able to see it. And that can lead to people demanding justice and demanding that um, these people are held to account. Um, 
This is what Man Attell referred to as Seuss valence, um, which essentially means that um, a person involved in a particular activity is also recording that activity. So it could be things like body cams on police or um, people at protests and things like that with their cameras out filming what's happening. Um, people who are involved in fights and assault filming that um, rather than kind of trying to break it up. Instead, phones are out. Let's film it. And we've seen lots of examples of this surveillance in um, people on tubes ranting um, racist and homophobic and Islamophobic um, rhetoric. And people have filmed it and posted it to social media. Um, posted it to the police so that they can then be arrested. So this idea of citizen journalism, this idea of sous surveillance is it doesn't require the police to surveil you anymore because everybody's doing it. Everybody is watching everybody else and you don't know what they're going to do with that um, information. Um, and with Twitter and social media and YouTube, gets put up on YouTube that can lead to informal social control of behavior by ridicule and ostracization but it can also lead to um, formal social control through the police because that that can be used as evidence against you okay so this idea of synoptic surveillance everybody watching everybody else can create crime control and prevention because you you are aware uh, or you you don't know who is watching you and that uh, that can be used against you next up we've got the idea of post panopticon society from Bo bowman and lyon and again this is coming from a um, postmodernist viewpoint and they argue that we've actually gone beyond the panopticon. Now, the panopticon was an idea put forward by Foucault with regard to a circular prison. And we'll talk more about that when we do um, crime, um, criminal justice system and punishment. But according to Bowman and Lyon, daily life has become more transparent. But with more people watching us and we're watching more people, it's difficult to determine who's watching who and who is actually watching us. Um, and they argue that people are monitored in most areas of their life, but no one it can be 100% sure of who it is that is monitoring them. Who's watching the CCTV footage? Who is looking through your internet history? Who is looking at what your shopping habits are or where you're going in your car? Um, and because we don't know who is watching us, that can act as a form of social control and act as a crime control and prevention. Because if we don't know, we, we're aware we're being watched 24 seven, but we don't know who by, it could always come, it could always be somebody who could then um, arrest us or take it or, or be part of the criminal justice system. Um, and, Beaumont and Leon point out that this idea of post panoptical society and as a form of crime prevention not only causes issue with privacy because we don't know who's watching us and who's doing what um, with that data, but it can also have problems linked to justice and human rights. We have a right to privacy, but if every moment of our day is being monitored, then and, and even things like Fitbits and um, exercise trackers and things like that, sleep trackers, they're linked to apps on our phones. So if somebody wanted to, they could track from the moment we wake up in the morning to the moment we go to sleep at night and find out everything about our day through the data that our phones collect, our computers collect, our de smart devices collect, and that can then be used not only in terms of things like um, stalking, but it could be used as evidence against us. We can tell that you were in the area of this crime taking place because your mobile phone was tracked there. 
we can tell that you weren't at home when you said you were because your Fitbit tells us you were walking at that point. So all of these sort of like this data is being collected about us, but we don't know who has access to it or how somebody is using it. Um, a really good example of this um, is the TV show You, which um, there's been two seasons of on Netflix and how um, the lead character in that show uses social media and uses digital footprints to stalk and date the female character in, in the show. And it's a good TV show, really creepy and quite scary. Um, you've then got this idea of actuarial justice by Feely and Simon. And this is the idea that um, that surveillance can be used as a crime prevention by looking at it from an almost insurance point of view. So they use actuarial um, mathematics within insurance to work out how risky you are to insure. And the more risky you are, the higher premiums you pay. In terms of crime prevention, it's about the calculations of risks applied to particular events and groups of people, um, which can lead to police targeting, which obviously is not a good thing. Um, but it's things like uh, using the example of airport security checks. This actu actuarial justice will identify what sort of people coming from what sort of countries are the ones that you need to check for drugs or for smuggling or for illegal other illegal activity um, who needs to be checked because they might be involved in terrorism um, and there will be criteria that are almost like a checklist that says ticking off all these boxes means that you are a higher risk and therefore you need to be um, checked by the police and th these checklists are you done through the liquid surveillance through the physical surveillance that we have in society that's where they're getting that data from to weigh up the risks um, now Gary T Marx no relation to Karl Marx um, refers to this as categorical um, categorical suspicion so it's creating categories of people who you need to be suspicious of this group is really suspicious because they look at these things and they look at that and they've been here and they've done that. This group, not so much because they stay at home all day and don't really do very much. Um, so this group, we're going to have to target a little bit closer. The other group we can kind of forget about. So it, it's that use of surveillance to determine who is a risk of committing crime, who is a risk of being deviant and linking that to police targeting. Now, the last thing we're going to look at is the Kilburn experiment by Newburn and Heyman. Now, this um, experiment, it was actually a, a study rather than an experiment, but they, it, they titled it as an experiment, was conducted in Kilburn Police Detention Centre in, in London. And they used covert observation for this. And what they wanted to find out was how being watched, how the surveillance affects um, the criminal justice system. And what they found was that the use of surveillance within the, the um, detention centre, the CCTV cameras in cells and around the, the, the building, the body cams of the police officers, um, and all of these things, having somebody constantly watching you can actually have a protection element, not just a erosion of civil liberties. Um, and this is because it can be used as evidence for the defence as well as evidence for the prosecution. So if a defendant says that their um, confession was coerced or they were beaten by the police, because everything's on camera, they can actually see whether or not there was excessive force used. They can see the, they can hear the language being used by the police officers which can then protect the suspect. But at the same time, 
when those accusations are made, it can actually go the other way and protect the police officer because they've got evidence that they were acting within reasonable um, constraints when dealing with a particular suspect. So for Kilburn, uh, uh, for the Newburn and Heyman, the idea of surveillance, it's not only about preventing and controlling people and, and preventing crime, it can actually be a positive for the criminal justice system to actually help convictions and protect the criminal justice system. So all of these ways, there are all these different types and views of surveillance as a form of crime prevention. But the key question we have is, is surveillance a good form of social control or not? So what, so what sociologists are interested in is, yes, we've got all these different types of uh, surveillance and some people think uh, the way uh, some are positive about surveillance, some are negative about surveillance and how they how the surveillance interplays with the idea of crime control and prevention. But the root cause or the root of the question is, is surveillance a good form of social control? Now, some do say, yes, it is. And they use and there are various reasons for that. First of all, it can help lower the fear of crime. If you know that you are being surveilled, if you know that there are CCTV cameras, you are less likely to fear being a victim of crime because if they attack you or if they rob you or if something happens, it's going to be caught on camera. And if you remember, one of the things that from crime control and prevention from the right realists is that you have to make it harder for people to commit crime. And by putting CCTV cameras up, you are preventing people from committing crime. Therefore, you are lowering the fear of crime. People feel safe when they are in a heavily surveilled environment and they feel safe in the term that they don't think that they're going to be a victim of crime. It's also good because it can help fight against terrorism. Things like the Investigatory Powers Act, if you're monitoring somebody's internet traffic um, and they do have a massive computer at GCHQ, which has a long file or big massive file of words that if certain combinations of words are searched up on the internet, it will raise a flag. And that will, uh, certain times it will, um, require further investigation at other times perhaps not so for example obviously I teach sociology so there are times when I'm putting certain phrases into my search engine along with my teaching of PSHE um, that might raise flags but the GCHQ computer can differentiate between me looking up um, treatments for drug addiction for PSHE and serial killers for sociology and see that, they're, that, that it's not me looking up how to be a serial killer or how to, to get hold of drugs and things like that. But, so, but sometimes with, in terms of terrorism, fighting against terrorism, they will have key watchwords and that can indicate, okay, perhaps these, this group is someone, a group we need to look into further. It provides evidence for both prosecution and defence. So it, surveillance is a good form of social control because it gives evidence to prove somebody guilty, but it can also give evidence to prove someone's innocence or protect somebody. And finally, it protects, as we said, it protects both the police and um, the suspect. The suspect possibly from police brutality or coercion and the, and the police from false accusations of police brutality. However, it's not all good. It can be easily considered as oppressive and um, by as a form of social control and it can be easily abused. How do we know that um, that things aren't going to be used against us? Now, you probably remember from um, your uh, learning about digital citizenship and things like that. Once something's online, it never goes away. 
what's to stop some and you see it on um, social media all the time somebody says something somebody else agrees with they troll back through prior tweets or prior postings and things like that and go well back in 2012 you actually said this and using past indiscretions and past events against them um there was a case of a young girl who was um given the role or uh, elected as um youth police commissioner and um after her election she it then came out that five or six years prior she had posted some very racist tweets or racist things on social media and she was asked to resign so it can easily be abused and it can easily be oppressive you've got it in, in the idea that you've got to be constantly careful about what you do because you don't know who's watching or how that's going to be used or could be used in the future there is little empirical evidence to suggest that it changes behavior it's argued that with so much cctv and it being coming so routine and so much part of our lives we just forget it's there and we don't care anymore and we still do whatever we want to do because it's it's just part of life now whereas when it was first introduced people were very careful because oh i'm on camera and so the, there's no clear study there's no clear evidence to suggest that being surveilled whether it be liquid surveillance whether it be physical surveillance will actually change behavior and it can lead to the erosion of civil liberties if you know the government is looking at everything you do you you kind of start losing that i that freedom of speech or the 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 thought that you could say what you would like within the law um and we see this kind of in um places like china where um people have been arrested based on things that they've tweeted anti-government sentiments things like that so it can this constant surveillance can lead to the erosion of civil liberties now whether or not surveillance is um a good form of social control or a good way to prevent crime and deviance is still to be determined and that's what sociologists are interested in is is surveillance a good way to prevent crime so just as a reminder then you need to make sure you've taken notes on this um, lecture um, use the, the notes grids to help you to structure your notes and highlight the notes grids to indicate your level of confidence within each box